I'll do something else. Yeah, that sounds it, great. It will be obvious, but uh, Josh, thank you so much for coming on. It is appreciated. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. I know you're, you're a family man, you've got music, you're, you're a busy guy, so it is appreciated that you take time out of your day uh, to speak to myself. But uh, first of all, how are you doing? I'm, I'm great. It's been a busy day. Well, I've had a busy week, but I, I'm, uh, I'm good. I'm, uh, I'm all busy around uh, my, my hometown, so not on, not on the road, uh, around my hometown right now. So uh, busy with uh, family stuff this yeah. week, so yeah. That's good. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about all things music. Okay. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll go back to the very beginning. So, Josh, where were you brought up? And were you into music when you were very young? Yeah, uh, I, I was uh, raised in, in in and around Owensboro, Kentucky. So, uh, Kentucky uh, in the United States. And, uh, yeah, I, I didn't much have a choice. My my dad is, is one of uh, 14 children in his family. So, he's the middle of 14 children. And um, the region that we come from is actually considered the home of bluegrass music. Right. Um, and everybody in my dad's family, they played uh, some kind of an instrument of the bluegrass variety. So uh, banjo, mandolin, guitar, upright bass, you know, something to that effect. Uh, and my dad was a fiddle player. Um, so and he was one of those guys that could play about anything that he touched. So by the time I come along, uh, around the age of probably seven or eight, uh, it started to pique my interest because I would always go with my dad to like family jam outs or like band yeah. practices with bands he was in. And uh, yeah, so very young, probably seven or eight, I started taking an interest in wanting to learn music. So obviously there, there was a lot of different instruments around that you were exposed to as a yes. young child. What made you pick up the guitar and vocals rather than maybe the drums or something else? It didn't immediately. Actually, the first instrument that I learned to play was the upright bass. And right. it, it, it was because my uncle, we were at a family bluegrass jam out, and uh, my uh, uncle Curtis, he, he played the upright bass. And it's just this very large and huge yeah. instrument. And, and, and as far as bluegrass goes, you know, if, if I was raised in a family that did rock, I mean, I would probably like the drums, you know. That's the, for, for, for the kids, man, it's either the lead guitar or the, or the drums. Um, but in the bluegrass world, the, the bass guitar was kind of the, the thing that stood out to me. It was this big, bulky instrument that, you you know, you kind of had to wrestle to, to play a little bit. And I don't know, it struck my interest uh, immediately. And, and uh, I remember telling my Uncle Curtis I wanted to play it. And, and uh, we had to load it on the back of my dad's very small Chevy, Chevy S10 truck <laughs> to get it home. And my dad taught me to play it. But um, I didn't pick up guitar. I played uh, upright bass. Uh, eight years old, I had to stand in a chair to play it, uh, and I wouldn't pick up the guitar until I was probably 12 or 13 years old, and I, I started wanting to learn to play guitar um, because I took an interest in singing and songwriting at around 12 or 13 years old, and I, you couldn't play bass and, and go out and play for people. I mean, yeah. you could, but it just it wasn't proper, you know, so, um, so I thought, well, I need to learn to play guitar so that I can go you know, yeah. go perform these songs for people. You know. it, it, funny that you say that. I mean, it's a, it's the the upright bass. It's not an instrument that you see uh, in Scotland. You know, too much. I mean, depending on what style of music, I suppose that you that you're um, going to look at. But just to give you a funny story, um, I was playing. I've I've played in the pubs, uh, in the bars for the last fifteen years, and. Uh, there was one Thursday night I was playing, and I was playing with another guy at the time, so there was the two of us were playing. And we're both playing, I'm playing lead guitar, he's playing rhythm guitar, singing. And uh, you know, normally you would get, people would come into the pub and there'd maybe be someone with a guitar, or you know, someone would come up to you in between a song and tell you that they sing, you know, something just the normal kind of instruments. There was actually a guy who came into the pub and he had a double bass on his back, I was like, now you don't see somebody wandering around with a double bass on their back too often because it's such a, a large instrument. And uh, I'm actually getting the guy, he's going to be coming on to do an episode, he's called Ian Donald. Ah. I'd never met him before, but he came up to me in between the song and he'd said, would there be any chance I could come up and play? 
So I was like, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Having never played with anybody with a double bass before, this guy was outstanding. He was Is it terrific? Absolutely brilliant. And uh, not only was he technically great on it, but he had all the showmanship. You know, he was twirling the bass and everything. It, it was brilliant to watch. Oh, but, that's uh, great. But oh, he's, one of, he's one of those guys that, um, you know, you give him any instrument and he's just brilliant at it. It's, fr- it's annoying. Yeah, that's, that's, my, my dad was kind of like that, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, what sort of music uh, were you listening to? What type of bands and musicians were you brought up with? Um, early on, probably country uh, and, and, and bluegrass music took my interest uh, first. And uh, then as, as I got older, especially in like middle school and high school, I took a huge, uh, I had a huge love for hip hop music actually. And, and it took, it probably took all my interest for several years. I don't know, I became obsessed with it and kind of went through a phase with that. And, uh, and then kind of came back around into a, uh, you know, the music that I make, it's, it's considered today's country in, in uh, you know, in, in, in the charts where I'm from. Yeah. But really, it's 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 closer to what I would consider like uh, what Bob Seger was, that the Eagles were, you know, it's which was considered rock back in the '70s and '80s. Um, but in today's you know world, it's it's everything's kind of just morphed down into country a little bit, and that's kind of the label that gets stuck on it. But yeah. uh, those are people that I grew up listening to was Bob Bob Seger, the Eagles. I love those bands, uh, and then a lot of '90s country, a lot of '90s country. Yeah, and. Um... Just to give to give everyone a, a laugh, possibly embarrass yourself. Do you remember the first music album that you ever bought with your own money? That you went to the shop and you bought it. Yes, you know, you know. Funny enough, um, uh, Toby Keith just passed away a few weeks ago. Um, uh, who's a big country artist that that I, I grew up listening to, and um, one of the first CDs that I ever bought was when I was I was ten years old. Um, the first CD that I ever owned was his album. It was called "How Do You Like Me Now," and it was a, yep. it was a Toby Keith album. And I, I literally—it was the only CD I had, and it was all I listened to. And I, I literally wore the pain off of the front of it. I listened to it so much. And what about? Do you remember the first concert that you ever went to? Yes, uh, the first uh, concert I ever went to was Kid Rock, actually. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I. It, I was in the ninth grade, so I was probably 14 years old, yeah. and um, I went with uh, a buddy of mine from school. I wasn't even a, a, a fan, you know. I hadn't listened to any of his music. At, we didn't. My dad wouldn't let me listen to Kid Rock and stuff like yeah. that at my house. And a and a, a really good friend of mine from school, his mom was taking him for his birthday and had an extra ticket to bring a friend, and I talked my dad into letting me go. And uh, sure enough, my first concert was Kid Rock, like back in his heyday too. This was like back when he was on it, and it was amazing. Still to this day, not um, you know, still to this day, one of the best concerts. I've seen him several times since. One of the best concerts I've ever seen, like live. Boy, what year would that have been? Yeah, it would have been, see, I was 14, so probably 2004. Three, two thousand and four. Right. Just trying to figure out your age. I'm probably a yeah. little bit a little bit older than yourself. Probably. Yeah, I'm thirty four, I don't mind to say. Yeah, yeah. I'm probably a decade down the line from you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I was a similar situation. My friend had a spare ticket and it was to go and see Metallica. Oh my goodness. Uh, so I I went along and it was nineteen ninety six. The, the oh, so that, oh, that, that would that's their heyday so that's that's incredible yeah, that, that was back when they were still drinking and um, yeah and a bit wild <laughs> that's amazing man I would, I would. It's, it's definitely um you can sit and listen to to the albums all day long it doesn't matter how good your your hi-fi is or your, or your headphones but there's something different when you're standing in a concert venue and you feel the music coming through the speakers, it, it hits you differently. Oh, absolutely. I, I believe live music, the energy that's produced when you play, uh, you, you can capture it in the right room if, if you're careful while you're recording, but uh, it's nothing like what you're going to get live, you know? Yeah, it's a special thing. See, for, um, you're obviously playing the guitar, you're singing. Are you completely self-taught or did you get lessons? 
Um, so my dad taught me to play the bass, and so my um, and and he he was not a uh, he, he was all uh, played by ear. So uh, no concept of of uh, of uh, written music or anything like that. So I was kind of taught yeah. the same way. I was taught the chords, and but there there is a basic. Uh, there is a basic uh, theory of music that he kind of, uh, it was like his own version of music theory that, that he taught me in the process of teaching me the bass. So yeah. when it came time for me to learn to play guitar, uh, he played guitar, like when he was teaching me to play bass, he also played guitar. So he would play guitar while I played bass so that he could teach me. So I would just watch his hands and I would, I would uh, figure out the chords from what he's doing. And uh, I knew the basic theory of, uh, of chords and things like that. So all I had to do was learn the shapes for the guitar. Yeah. And then it, it's just a practice from there on, you know, it's just getting it down. So, so I was self-taught on the guitar, I guess you could say, yeah. What about your singing? Because I've spoke to, I've spoke to a lot of people about singing and singing's a, a strange one because if you play an instrument, you can, you know, some people get lessons, some people, you know, especially nowadays, you can go online, you can go on YouTube and you can figure out anything, you know, but uh, but you also can learn from other people. Vocals are, are one where you do have to have some type of talent, you need to be able to hold a tune, you need, need to be able to listen, but there is an element of it which is confidence, and there's a lot of people don't do it or they fail at it because they don't have the confidence to stand in front of a microphone in front of people and actually sing. Yeah. How do you get into the singing part? Well, my, my mama, she jokes around all the time about the fact that like when I was four years old, very young, I mean, very young, uh, she could have guests over and I was just from the wound, I, I was that type of child that just wanted to stand on the table and and sing, and I, I could remember lyrics at a very young age. Uh, she goes on all the time. The movie The Mask, by, the Jim Carrey movie The Mask, yeah. uh, she said, I could remember word for word the entire movie. I've just always had a talent for remembering lyrics and things like that. So um, I don't know how much, I don't know how good of a singer I was as a child, but I definitely had the passion for it and definitely uh, just dove right into it and didn't, I, I guess, didn't care if I was good or not. And yeah. I, you know, I, I, and that if you have that, you can definitely have a space to learn as you go. You know, <laughs> the confidence is the, is, like you said, is is the first thing. I'm like you. There's so many people I know, even from my uh, my home area, that uh, oh man, they could sing me under the table. They could play me under the table, um, but they just they never have had the you know the ability to to be able to get up and and, and do it and just just go with it yeah and I, I think mean, about that all the time you know like it's a, it's a two-part thing really yeah I mean I've even I've even had people on previous episodes who sing and they will be the first person to admit that they're not a very good singer but what they lack in ability they make up for in confidence almost to the point that they trick people into thinking they're actually better than they are because sure. they've got all the confidence in the world and sometimes that's all you need. I mean, you probably need obviously a bit of both, you know, but. Sure. You know, there's, and, and here's the thing. It's, it's, it's very difficult because there's, there's so many different kinds of music and, and even in, in genres that we love so much, there's so much, so many different kinds of music. So like, and being a singer, for example, I think about this all the time, about the fact that um, there's people like Freddie Mercury, you know, just naturally just probably one of the most gifted vocalists and with range and 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 could, could hit different ranges and things like that it, it'd be hard to compare anybody to him someone like adele you know like the vocal range that they have chris stapleton people like that um but some of my favorite music in the world uh, are singer songwriters like john prine um i don't know if you're familiar with john prine or not but um a singer songwriter i there's no way that you could call him a great vocalist, but he's one of my favorites. I love his 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 songwriting; it's just outstanding. And and uh, 
but still, yeah, he he holds a plate. He may not. It doesn't have to be a great vocalist, I guess. You know, to was that that's the beauty of music is that everybody finds something different in it that's for themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's there's a there's a place in it for everybody, and I think um, the people su- that succeed in it are the people that find their place in it, and uh, the people that maybe haven't figured out how to succeed at, in it are people that maybe extremely talented but they just haven't found the lane the lane for themselves yet is that you yeah. know i mean i mean i always think as well i mean I, i've been playing guitar now for <clears throat> over 30 years yeah and um singing and doing gigs and it it's amazing i always feel like that there's two different types of musicians so I, i've got friends who are technically outstanding. You know, they, they know so much more than myself. Uh, they could run rings around me on the guitar, but if you were to go and ask them to go and write a basic song, you know, go away for an hour and come back with a song, they couldn't do it because yeah. it, it's almost like they're, they're too technical that sometimes they forget that some of the best songs ever written are the some of the simplest. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and sometimes you need a wee bit of both and you know sometimes it works for one person it doesn't work for the other there's, there's lots of different things it maybe depends on the style of music I suppose, you know music is just so different and varied but that's why so many people like it sure I've got a perfect example there's um, two guys from my hometown they're, they're much younger than me but they're outstanding guitar players probably the best uh um, in my hometown where I come from, I'd say. And I've, I've had the opportunity to have both of them in bands with me. And um, both these guys are the exact same age. Uh, they went to school together. Um, and they were taught guitar by the exact same guitar teacher, okay? Um, one is a very introverted person, was probably more book smart, uh, you know, was smart. The other was uh, a little more risque, uh, a little more personality and now both of these guys were taught the exact same way by the exact same teacher both best guitar players i've ever heard both have completely different styles of playing like yeah. even though they're playing the same things they one is very technical and very book smart the you know and then one is very play from the hip and 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 you know, and it's just interesting. It's interesting how you can be the exact same age and learn from the same person but have completely different approaches to the, the same instrument. It's funny that you say that. I've had, I've seen almost the exact same thing where I've, I've seen two guitarists both both play the same, um, both lead guitarists playing the same lead guitar part. So they're both playing the same notes. One of them is very technical, and the other one, it's almost like they play more with feel. Yeah. Uh, the, they're playing the same thing, but it sounds very different, and you can tell straight away who's playing what. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is fascinating to kind of, of see how that works, but moving forward, Josh, obviously, I know that you're currently playing playing just now. I was looking, I was looking at some of your... Um, things on Instagram today and uh, YouTube and all the other bits and pieces. I, I know it's kind of goes by your name, but are you playing a, in a band or is it solo or is it a bit of both? It's kind of a little bit of both right now. So um, since the pandemic, um, where everything got locked down pretty tight, when I was coming out of that, um, I'd, I'd had a band before that that I was kind of strictly playing with. And then uh, once everything shut down and we lost all of our gigs, um, when we were getting back going, I was having an easier time just booking myself and and getting solo gigs just to get back going because it's you know I'm a I'm a uh, I, I just play music for a living so there was no other source of income besides these shows that we were going out to do, and so I had to get back to that as quick as possible. So once everything got back going, um, it was much easier. Um, to book solo and then it's it's like anything it's like pushing a rock down the hill once you get going with something it just seemed like I, I booked all solo stuff and then I looked up and a year had passed and I'm I'm an acoustic solo artist all of a sudden and so but that was okay because coming out of the pandemic we started working on the album we just released 
and um, I was using mostly studio guys for that. I was working in Nashville to do that together, so wasn't exactly working with the band I'd been playing with anyway. And so that kind of gave me time to go out and play acoustic and then go down to Nashville and uh, record the album uh, with some of those guys and, and kind of take a different approach to it. So now once we've put the album back out, I've slowly started to transition in the last two months uh, back with the band. I've got a three-piece band that I'm running around with right now. So so talk talk me through the band. Who do you have in the band playing with you? But right now, it's, it's kind of... Uh, we're kind of using the Nashville approach, so I've, I've got two different drummers that I'm kind of subbing out all the time right now, and two different bass players. Um, sure. But uh, up until probably this last week, uh, one of my best friends, his name's Chris Lee, has been playing for me, and uh, I've played with Chris since, since we were in high school, off and on, and uh, Chris plays with several bands that are from where I'm from, and... He's an absolutely phenomenal drummer. Um, there's another guy named Colin Jones that I've been using a lot. He's from Evansville, Indiana. Very talented. And uh, we've only been playing together a little over a year. And uh, and then on bass guitar, I've uh, had a friend of mine named Sterling Miller. And, uh, yeah, he's fantastic. It's been a pleasure. Do you prefer playing in a band to playing solo? Or does it, does it not bother you? Ooh, it's a good question, and uh, I, I like both for different reasons. And and uh, I I really do like playing by myself a lot. Like uh, for one, it's when you're. When I came up acoustic, and I'm I'm a very singer songwritery performer anyway. So when you're playing uh, solo and by yourself, you're completely in the driver's seat. You know, yeah. and even in, in a band as the lead singer or the leader of the band, you're still in the driver's seat. But playing in a band, I've always compared it to dancing. Because it's the same way. It's you may know the steps and know where you're going to go, but the movement all becomes organic as you're going. Everything moves and shifts within each other, and it's a it's a it's a very I consider it just like I, you would if you were dancing with somebody. There's somebody that leads, but there's a follow that happens with the whole way. And I love that part of it though, and I yearn for it. So I'll go and play solo for several months at a time. Yeah. And man, I'll really get to miss them playing with a band and, and wanting that camaraderie and, and that, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, that I, energy on stage, you know. Yeah. And then I'll play with a band for a few months and I'll think, man, you know, I, I wouldn't mind going and booking a couple by myself just to go do that for a little while. So, so um, recording with the band in, in the studio, how do you, for, for the type of music you're doing, how do you go about recording? So, for example, some bands will record all the drums first, and then they'll put the bass, and then they'll put the guitars and the vocals, and they'll layer it up bit by bit. Mm -hmm. Other bands will maybe go and record rhythm guitars, bass, drums live, and then they'll do overdubs. Do you, how do you go about recording? What's comfortable for yourself? Okay, so my my last record, my previous record, Reynolds Station. Uh, we completely stack recorded that. So I went in with just me and an acoustic guitar and laid all the rough tracks um, mm -hmm. for every song on that record. And then we brought people in one by one and recorded that record. Are, um, you, playing, are you playing to a click track? Yes, yes. So I, I'm, I'm, we set up a click track. I played to the click track. And then we had drums and bass come in at the same time. Uh, then we would had a lead guitar player come in after that. We literally... Uh, stacked them like one would come in and finish yep and um so the, this record we just released 206 um a different approach but we also took the same approach so the way we did it this time um uh chris and sterling who i've been playing with they came in with me and the three of us went in and laid all all of the the basic tracks um f for that and uh I love that because we was able to capture the energy a little bit more with yeah. the three of us. So we came in, kind of had a basic idea of how I wanted the songs to go, but also uh, kept the door open to interpretation. And I, I wanted to really capture something in the studio. And we went in and we just laid all those tracks. Then after the fact, I had um, keyboard players come in, electric guitar players. I had a, a horn player come in and we kind of stacked on top of that. But the um, 
rhythm guitar, the bass guitar, and the drums. So the, the foundation of the songs, I recorded all at once. And uh, after doing that, I have to say, that's probably the way that I'll approach it from now on. Yeah, so um, 206 is an album. How many songs are on it? Uh, there's eight songs. Eight so, songs, that record. Relatively short record, but it was uh, I did it that way on purpose. So when you were going in to you know, I'm going to start writing this this new album. Did you write eight songs or did you write 12 and then pick the best eight? How, how did you go about writing the songs? Did you just simply write eight songs? Uh, no, so um, the 206 is a concept record. Uh, there's, there was, there's a vein of a topic that runs through the whole record. And um, I actually wrote all this album uh, through the course of a relationship that I was in, and and so um, w with an ex, so um, a lot of people would call something like that a breakup record, but I've always said no, it's a relationship record because I didn't. The songs aren't just from after the fact. I have um, the first song on the record, a love song. It's it's you know it's like the start of a relationship, and it's the album literally follows the course of a relationship. So there's a love song. There's a song where things aren't going too great. There's a song where that person's left and you're lonely. And then I, I end the record on a song called The Path to where it's this, hey, we need to pick ourselves up and move on type of song, you know? And uh, so um, those songs were written uh, throughout a relationship. And here's the thing. So that relationship lasted probably uh, two and a half years, something like that. And it was an on again, off again relationship. So there was good times and bad times and plenty to write about. And I wrote a lot of other different stuff during that time, but once I got ready to go in to record a record and I was figuring out what kind of a record I wanted to record, I went through all my songs. I probably had um, oh, 22, 23 songs. Mm -hmm. And as I was going through them, I thought, man, I really like the, the songs that came from that relationship. I said, man, wouldn't it be cool? And uh, wouldn't it be something that people could really relate to, to do yeah. a whole album? about a relationship, you know, the, the rise and fall of it. With the band, how, how do you go about songwriting? So for example, do you come up with a basic song idea, a song structure, take it to the practice and show it to the other guys to, who do they then contribute their parts and do you then build it from there to make it better? Or do you meet up with no ideas and simply jam and see what happens? Yeah, so it, it was it was it was a mix of uh, we definitely didn't get together. So at the time, I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna go record a record and have everything ready to go." Um, I'm playing with Chris and, and Sterling now, but at the time, I was playing completely acoustic. Right. Like I said, so I hadn't even really been playing with them on a regular basis. I, I kind of called them up, cold called them up, and like, "Hey, I'm about to record a record. Would you like to do this?" And we hadn't played together in a long time, so know what I did. Um, I, I made uh, demos with just me playing the songs acoustic um, with my cell phone, actually. And I sent them uh, those files over to listen to. And I told them, I told them uh, from the beginning, I was like, hey, this is the structure of the song, but I'm totally open to interpretation. I just want you to have a uh, basic knowledge of what the song's gonna be before we get to the studio. But I want it to be so that when we get to the studio, we can kind of make this into what it needs to be, you know? So so the song was written and structured by me. And then once we got down there, uh, we kind of let the song become what it was as we were playing at the studio, which was pretty neat. And um, what about, uh, well, first of all, the album 206, what's the 206? What, okay, what's so the, the, rela the relationship that I referred to, um, my, my, uh, my ex, the first date we ever went on, I can remember we were out to eat um, and we got the receipt and on the receipt it said 206 and she pointed it out. She's like, look, 206. And weeks, the first weeks of our relationship, I noticed that she'd just see this number. We'd be in the car and she'd see 206 on the... And so this was just a number that followed her for a long time. And she said she'd seen it forever, maybe because she was looking for it, but maybe because it, you know, followed her. Uh, well, anyway, fast forward after the relationship ended, I was actually on tour. I think I was in um, Iowa, and we had a day off. And uh, this was very early after this relationship hadn't been over long. It was uh, still, I was still stinging over it, you know. 
and uh, I had a day off, and we went to this palm reader in town, um, and this lady read my palm and um, told me my angel numbers, and one of the numbers that came up was two of six randomly, yep. and, and she told me that that number was a sign of redemption when you see it. It usually means that there's a, a place or time for growth and, and for something to, to grow and to live after that. And I thought, man, that really sums up the, the relationship that I was in. And it's, it's kind of a good title for, for, the, for the album, which is about that relationship. So that's where that came from. So here's a question for you, for you, Josh. Some people will go into the studio and they'll write, record some songs and it's really, they have to do it in order to go out and start gigging, playing live, they need the songs. Do you prefer recording? Do you like recording? Or do you prefer it being live on stage? Mm, I, I like both, you know. When I when I recorded my, my first album, which was my first like approach at doing it professionally, mm -hmm. I was very intimidated, to be honest. I, I uh, had hired a, a producer that, that I knew from Nashville who had his own studio, who uh, worked with all kinds of people. And, and that first record, I had the current keyboard player from Leonard Skinner played on that record, Peter Keys. Um, the bass, uh, Cheryl Crow's bass player played on that record. And I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never been in that setting, had no clue what I was doing, which was why I hired a producer, someone that did know what they were doing, that could, yeah. they could take the reins. Um, but I found myself being very intimidated uh, during recording that record, but I, I learned a lot while recording that record. And uh, I wasn't intimidated because anybody was not friendly or anything like that. It was a great experience. I, I was just ill-experienced and I was learning at the time. Um, but when I went to record, um, my most, my most recent record, uh, I was much more confident when I went in and um, I had a better understanding of, of what I was doing and what was going to be so that so I could prepare before and kind of know how I wanted to approach it to make the music that I wanted to make. So it was a lot more fun the second time because I felt more comfortable. And, and I'm guessing you, you like creating something from nothing. Yeah, I love it. I love yeah. it. Once I was comfortable, I loved the idea of the studio. I love being in there. I love, I, you know, uh, for anyone that's never been in a, in a studio setting like that, I mean, uh, oh man, you, you, we'd start at seven o'clock in the morning and uh, we'd be in there at midnight that night with the door locked and the shades and just hammering down, listening to these songs over and over, figuring out what they needed. And, uh, as tired as you get and as fatigued as you get, there's, I don't know, there's something beautiful about it. It's like painting a picture, you know, and uh, I, I really do love it. Um, it's the same as uh, before, I'm kind of both sides of the fence, though. I, I love playing live as well. I, I couldn't, there are artists now that I, that only record, you know, and, and they don't go play live as much as some people do. And uh, I couldn't do that. Like I, I have an appreciation for going and, and making original art, um, but I, I think the, I think the thing I love the most about music is being able to perform for people. I really do love performing for people and getting to share that with people. So how do you how do you see the songs going over live? Because something about something's interesting. See when you're when you're playing songs. There'll be songs that, that you have wrote, that you've practiced, and in your head you think this song is this song's great, this song is gonna go over great in front of people. And sometimes you play that song and it for whatever reason it just doesn't connect. Mm -hmm. But you'll play another song that may almost just be under your radar. It's 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 almost like it's not that important a song to you and it just connects, it's strange, you don't know what songs, the songs you think are going to connect, but they might not, and then there's other songs that connect that it's almost a surprise that it happens. How, do, how have the songs been going across live? That, that happens a lot, actually. So on my previous record, um, kind of being three years away from that, and, and uh, have gotten to do that from start to finish, um, that's kind of exactly what happened. Um, the song How Many Times was kind of, after everything was said and done, was the big favorite off of that record. And it was my song that did the best off that record. 
it wasn't my favorite when we went into the studio. It wasn't my favorite when we got done. I did not like it. I, I loved it. I wouldn't have put it out if I didn't like it. Um, but it wasn't top of the list by any means at all. And But it was the one that connected with people the most. And uh, it takes that trial and error. You have to get out in front of people and play it to know what they're going to like. Because that's the thing. You can, uh, going back, when you're recording music, it's you're in the driver's seat a little bit more you know you're you're in control and uh you're kind of making something hoping that people like it when you're playing live it's it's very much a trial and error thing it's very much like i'm gonna play this and you get done and you're like did that one work and the ones that do you take note of and and uh when you're going to make your set list for the next show you 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 fix it and, and you try to make the best set list as possible so you can go out and entertain people. Yeah. So Josh, we've been quite serious up to this point with a lot yeah. of uh, interesting questions. So before we finish up, I'm going to ask you some fun questions. Sure. Okay. So imagine that you could um, you could go back in time. What's, is there a concert that you wish that you could have attended years ago? Oh man, that's a really good question. Um, there's a there's a, a lot. Uh, one that's coming to mind, like and I'm a big Eagles fan. The the Hell Freezes Over uh, tour. Uh, I've had I've got so many family members that got to be there for those. They said those were great. Um, one that would probably be interesting to most people, um, Woodstock '99 which was a complete cluster. <laughs> you know, it was horrible. Like, there's so much bad that happened. Um, my brother-in-law was actually there at that. He's, he's older than me and uh, was was there. And and so they, they did a documentary about it a few years ago. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and uh, it was interesting. I went and watched the documentary with him and, and he was like, yeah, this happened and was telling me like from first person experience. And as bad as it was, he said, oh, it was awesome. It was just, it was, you know, so just yeah. the anarchy of it a little bit was, was just something else. So I don't know, like, I, I think I might, I might have wanted to be there just to have experienced it a little bit. Yeah. Right. Obviously you play lots of different instruments. Yeah. Is there an instrument that you don't play that you wish that you could play? Ooh, that's a very good question. And yes, um, the the fiddle or the violin again. My, my dad is a is a fiddle player, and uh, I've tr you know I've tried to take it up several times. And you think because my dad did it that it would it would come a little more natural, and it's never come natural to me. I've never been able to get a hankering for it, and uh, it's just because my old man does it. I'd like to be able to pass that on a little bit, yeah, and at least have a basic understanding of it. But I don't. <laughs> and. Uh... You know yourself, there is thousands, millions of great songs that have been written and recorded over the years. What's the one song that you wish you could have been in the recording studio to witness it being recorded? Ooh, man, these are good questions, man. Um, let me think about that. Let's see. So I. Oh, man. You know, Go Rest High on the Mountain uh, is a Vince Gill song. And, uh, Lord, it, it, it's one of those songs that uh, it, anytime it comes, it's obviously an emotional song. A lot of people use it for, for funerals and things like that. So it's emotional in itself. But I, I've i never heard that song. And it's not like I cry every time it comes on, but I've never heard that song and not felt something emotionally or got cold chills or something like that. And I couldn't imagine being in the studio when they laid that down. Um, and then um, if, I, if I let me do it, I want to cheat and do two. Uh, Take it easy by the Eagles. I, that's I've, I've heard a lot of the stories about that song and how it came to be, and and uh, that one would, would have been fun for sure. I, I'm not a big Eagles fan, but I do like okay. that. Yeah, I do like that song, and, I, and I, I do play it as well. So it is a good tune. And, yeah. Uh, last question for you, Josh. Mount Rushmore, who is the four musicians or bands for yourself that, to you, are perfect? They are perfect? Yeah. Ooh, man, good questions. Um, man, so I... Willie Nelson, for sure. I'm a huge Willie Nelson fan. Um, 
John Prine, uh, another one. Um, let's see. I'm gonna put. Um, mm. Tricky. It is. I'm gonna put Waylon Jennings on there. Yep. Uh, just because of his influence. Um, and uh, I'm gonna throw a current guy on there. I'm gonna say Chris Stapleton, man. I think Chris Stapleton's just got the—he's got the guts for it. So, is that a, is that Mr. Tennessee Whiskey? Yeah, yeah, it's him. You know, that's the one he's known for, man. But uh, I—I I tell people all the time I've been listening to Stapleton. He's one of those guys I've been following since way before he was Chris Stapleton, man. When he was just coming up in Nashville, so I, I have a big appreciation for him. Josh, it has been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank yeah, you wish- for having me. I had an absolute blast. That's fine. I wish you all the success in the future. And uh, we'll keep in touch and uh, I'll keep track of what you're up to. I'd like that. I'd like that. Thank you for having me. No problem. Cheers, pal. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah.